Forex Market Series titled Introduction to Technical Analysis Part 2. My name is Alistair and I am the host for today's session. So this afternoon, we are privileged to have Hao Guang and Enzi, Junior Analyst from Morris Grayson, a management consultancy firm, as our speakers for the webinar. They would be sharing with us about the mechanics of technical analysis in the foreign exchange market, building upon the foundations of what was discussed during our previous session, as well as clarifying doubts or queries some of you may have about this topic. So this session will be kick-started by the sharing of our speakers, followed by a question and answer segment. The link for your questions will be provided in the chat function, as well as at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions along the way, do fill up the form and send them in. I will then raise the questions up to the speakers once this presentation is over. Without further ado, let us welcome Hao Guang and Enzi to begin today's session. Thank you, Alistair. Well, to start off, we'll be going through an introduction into our currency market. So this comprises of five segments. Firstly, an introduction, followed by which we'll go through the mechanics of it, uh, following which we we'll go through profit and losses, trading styles, as well as macroeconomic indicators, which you know a trader can look up for. So to begin, you know, uh, the currency market, the forex market, is the largest current is the largest market in which one nation currency can be traded for another in a mutual. investment flows and it operates 24 hours, five days a week. As for the sources of its market volume, you know, the bulk of it comes from hedging by companies as well as speculations by retail as well as institu institutional investors. And as for the period of highest liquidity, I think we'll go through more in depth on what we mean by liquidity later on. But all you need to know is that um, the volume is highest when the European session overlaps with half of the Asian trading day and half of the North American trading session. So that's about 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Singapore time, as well as 8 p.m. to 12 midnight Singapore time. As for the mechanics, um, in currency, you know, the purchase of one currency, it involves a simultaneous sale of another currency. So if you're looking for the dollar to go higher, for example, the question then obviously is higher against what? And the answer is higher against another currency. So in relative terms, if the dollar goes up against another currency, that other currency also has to go down against the dollar. And you know the forex is it, quoted in many different currency pairs, and there are symbols for eight main currencies. So, for example, you see euro slash USD is equivalent to one point three five zero five. Now, what does this actually mean? The euros is actually the base currency, while USD is the quote currency. So, let's say if this goes up to one point three five zero six, that means it actually increased by zero point one pip. Now, what is a pip? A pip is the smallest increment of the price fluctuation in all the currency prices, and all other currency pairs have a four-digit decimal place with the exception of Japanese yen. So if you take a look at the table, you know, euros, USD, grid, uh, pound, USD, and so on, all of them have a four-digit decimal place with the exception of USD, JPY, with a 0 0.01. Uh, apart from pips, there's also you know, the important concept of what, what, we, mean be, what, what we mean by uh, lots. And in this case, lots refers to the units of base currency. So for example, you have euros, USD, it will be quoted as one standard lot will be quoted as 100,000 euros. For mini lot, it will be 10,000. And for micro lot, it will be 1,000 euros. As for other terminologies that we, uh, I think is important for us to go through in this webinar will be firstly, what we mean, what we mean by liquidity. Now, li liquidity is intertwined together with volatility. And it essentially refers to the amount of market interest that is in you know, the Forex market right now. So the higher the liquidity usually translates to a higher volume that's available for you know, for sales. And that means it's easier and faster for you to, to actually buy or sell a security, which then reflects relatively minor price changes as well. Now, for volatility, it measures how drastically a market price, uh, <clears throat> a market prices change. And in this case, a, market, a market's liquidity tends to have a big impact on how volatile the market prices are. So a liquid market such as the Forex will tend to move in smaller increments because of the high liquidity, because of the high liquidity results in lower volatility. As for our bid and offer, so the bid price is the highest price that a buyer is prepared to pay for a financial instrument, while the offer price or the ask price is the lowest price which a seller will accept for the instrument. Now the difference between the bid and the offer price will translate to what we know as the bid ask spread. And the spread is essentially the transaction cost that is incurred when you trade with a particular broker. So 
For example, the difference between the bid and the offer price is a spread of two pips, and that is the spread for the broker to make the money. And no matter what direction you trade, you will always begin with two pips in depth. And lastly, we have what is what we know as risk, and that essentially refers to the amount of capital set aside to cover the risk. And more often than not, we follow the two percent rule. Now, for example, if an investor who uses the two percent rule and has a hundred thousand trading account uh, risks no more than two percent, that means he risks no more than two thousand dollars of the value of the account on a particular investment. Now, as for profit and losses, to calculate your profit and losses, it's really just you know the multiplication of the number of pips that you gain or lost uh, with the number of lots and the value per pip per lot. Uh, as mentioned previously, um, every pip, uh, every currency pip has uh, four decimal placings, 0 0.001, with the exception of Japanese yen, in this case, 0 0.01. As for our lots, as mentioned, if it's a standard lot, it'll be 100,000, mini lot, 10,000, and micro lot, 1,000. And you multiply all this together with the amount of pips that Now, most, <clears throat> most Forex brokers would provide a real-time market-to-market calculation, you know, showing your margin balance. And this market-to-market -market calculation that, that shows your unrealized profit and losses it based, is based essentially on when you would close your open position in the market at that instance. So depending on your broker's trading platform, if you're long, the calculation would typically be based on where you could sell at that moment. And if you're short, likewise, the price would be based on where you could buy at the moment. So the next thing we have is what we know as a margin level. And I think this is quite important for us to actually, uh, when it comes to profits and losses. And before we understand what, what is meant by margin level, we have to understand what is a margin in the first place. So um, Forex margin is basically a good fifth deposit that is needed to maintain an open position. And it's not a fee, neither is it a transaction cost, but it's essentially a portion of your account that is set aside and assigned as a margin deposit. And this is actually a very important concept for us to understand before we know what is a leverage. So what is a leverage? Assuming you have a leverage of 10 to 1 and you want to maintain an account of $10,000, that essentially means you only need to deposit $1,000 to maintain an account of $10,000. Now, how is this intertwined together with your margin requirement? If your margin requirement is, say, 5%, 5 over 100, that means that your maximum leverage will be 20 to 1. But likewise, if it's 2%, 2 over 100, you need one to, your maximum leverage should be 50 to one. Now, when it comes to uh, understanding your margin level, you have to understand what is the used as well as your usable margin. So, you know, it's quite self-explanatory. If, you know, it's a usable margin, it means you can still use this to actually open up, uh, or you, see, you can still use it to open a position. So if you want to calculate a margin level, it's essentially just the percentage of your used over your used margin multiplied by 100%. And many times if, you know, your margin level has been reached, um, a broker might actually call, make a margin call, which essentially means the liquidation of your current position. So at the bottom, we have an example. For example, you have $10,000 in your account and you have a margin level of 0 0.1. That means that you have a leverage of 10 to one. And assuming that you have made a losing, that you have a losing position of $9,000, that essentially means that you have a margin level of 100% and you are basically unable to open any new position. As for our trading plan, we'll go through a little bit more in depth in the later on of the presentation, but it's comprised of three main segments, uh, you know, position sizing, your entry point, and lastly, as a matter of risk management, your stop losses, as well as your profit taking levels. Uh, but for now, we'll also be going through, you know, more uh, additional orders, which we didn't really go through in the previous session. So what we went through previously were, you know, contingent orders. And, you know, as mentioned previously, there are six main uh, type of, types of contingent orders. You, there are your buy limit order, your sell limit order, your buy stop order, sell stop order, buy stop limit, as well as your sell stop limit. But in this session, we'll be going through more in depth of what we mean by a trailing stop order, as well as your OCO order. Now for your trailing stop order, it is a stop loss order that you set at a fixed number of pips from your entry rate. And the trailing stop loss adjusts the rate, the order rate as the market price move, as the market price move, but only in the direction of your trade. So for example, in this case, say you want to enter the market at 1.5750 trailing stop loss as at 30 pips. So that would translate to 1.5720. Assuming that you long the market and it actually managed to, and it actually does increase, uh, say to 1.5, your trailing stop loss will still maintain at 30 pips below that number. And in this case, it will be 1.5730. As for your OCO order, OCO order, stop 
plus order paired together with a take profit order. So an OCO order is, out, is you know, the ultimate insurance policy that you can have for any open position because your position still stays open until one of the different, well, until one of the order levels has been reached by the market and then subsequently close your position. So for example, say when one of your order level is reached and triggered, the other, the other order level will automatically cancel. So for example, you short, in this case, uh, Japanese yen at 117, at 117. And you think that it's going to go beyond 117.50. And if it continues going higher, that's where you decide to put your stop loss buying order. At the same time, however, you also believe that USD yen has a downside potential, say to 116.25. So obviously that's where you take your, that's where you set your take profit buying order. And now you have these two orders bracketing the market and your risk is clearly defined thereafter. So long as the market trades between these two levels, in this case, 116.24, as well as 117.47, your position will continue to remain open. And in this case, if 116.25 is reached first, then obviously you'll take profit order will be triggered and you buy back the profit. And if 117 is actually rich, your position is stopped at a loss. Um, to conclude, you know, the first portion of our presentation, there are some macroeconomic indicators which are so very important as well. So firstly would be job reports. And needless to say, you know, it measures the number of people unemployed or employed in a country. And obviously a vigorous job support uh, could actually drive up interest rates higher and rally even more stocks which actually makes the domestic currency even more attractive to your foreign investors. As for your CCI, that reflects your consumer sentiments. And obviously, if there's any sign of uh, feeling confidence or whatsoever, it would signal an alarm bells in the financial market. As for your GDP, quite obviously it refers to the measure of the output in a country. And obviously, a robust GDP would, be, would signal a good thing for your currency market as well. For your CPI, which measures uh, the effect of inflation, um, its effect on the currency market is less clear, as it is often the case in a healthy economy, especially if the economy is expanding and you know it's, it's coupled with rising interest rates and so on, it can actually make your domestic currency even more attractive. However, if the rates do surge primarily at account because of growing inflationary pressure, that can actually make that could actually hurt your domestic currency because obviously it's less competitive. As for your IPCU, that refers to your industrial production as well as capacity utilization. And it really just refers to the amount of goods that's produced as well as the slack that is left in the economy. And normally the currency markets react quite modestly to your industrial production. Foreigners would try to assess the production and capacity utilization, which will affect your inflation as well as um, interest rates in the economy. How, sorry, how it will affect the interest rate as well as future inflation in the economy. And lastly, for your housing starts, it just refers to the amount of new residential projects that are, you know, uh, that started in a given month. And obviously, you know, foreign investors will be attracted to your domestic currency if they can earn a higher rate of return relative to what they can earn in other countries. So therefore, a stronger housing report would be considered bullish for your domestic currency because it usually supports a scenario of higher, even higher corporate profits and the firming up of your domestic currency, of your domestic interest rates. Uh, right now, I'll be going through you know, a few uh, different types of trader. And in the previous uh, session, we covered four main types of traders, yeah, your scalpers, uh, day traders, string, tra string traders, as well as your position traders. However, for this webinar, I'll be going through uh, slightly more in depth for your short term as well to your medium term traders. And you know, listed here are some of the pros and cons of uh, your different types of traders. But what is more important is that uh, to know is, for example, if, you have, if you're a scalper, then your <clears throat> Now, our target would obviously be you know five to ten pips per trade, as well as be trading within you know seconds to minutes. If you are a day trader, however, your target would be twenty to forty pips per trade, and your day tra your trade duration would usually be within a day. And lastly, if you are a swing trader, naturally you will try to target you know fifty to one hundred and fifty pips per trade, and it will be within uh, no more than a week. So in this case, you'll be you know focusing a little bit more on uh, how a day trader will actually trade, and in this case, you know, first and foremost, it will be checking a four hour for checking the four hour timeline for trend as well as your potential support and resistance level, resistance level. And secondly, checking your lower time frame, so one hour for a confluence point. And lastly, going to your 30 minute time frame uh, to actually for your entry point. In this case, setting a stop loss, you take profit as well as your risk, ma risk management. And lastly, you know, finally entering your position. So in this case, we have you know uh, pounds against the USD. 
And if you look at the four-hour four hours timeline, it begins initially with a very strong downtrend, as noted by your three black crows. Now, uh, we'll go through a little bit more on you know, the different uh, signs of trend reversal, your candlestick patterns later on. But in this case, uh, we just know that you know, it's, it begins with a very, very strong downtrend initially. And if you look at you know, the significant support level that is drawn at 1.22436, they actually managed to stop the strong downtrend and resulted in a reversal afterwards. And then it went uptrend again and subsequently reversed downtrend with even lower lows and lower highs. At our one hour time frame, we see that it's coherent with the four hour time frame, and therefore we can actually go to our 30 minute time frame for entry. Next. As for our risk management and entry, we see that our 30 minute time frame, we can actually put our take profit order at the very strong support level, which is in this case, as mentioned previously, 1.22436. Now we don't know whether it may go up or down, so we decided to put our stop loss at the previous high, in this case, 1.23800 and short the market at 1.23400. In this case, we have a risk to re reward ratio of one to three. Thanks. Now, in this case, we also be going through, in this webinar, I'll be going through, you know, different trends and patterns as well that may signal reversal and or when to actually enter or exit the market. And in this case, you know, there are three main trends and patterns consisting of your pullback, breakout, as well as your continuation. For your pullback, it really is just a pause or a moderate drop in a stock or commodity pricing chart from a recent peak that has occurred within a continuing uptrend or downtrend. The duration is usually for a few consecutive sessions. And you know, what it really means is that it signals the, tra it signals the traders to enter or exit when the other indicators remain bullish or bearish. Next, we have our breakout. And you know, let us just say a breakout is just any price movement outside a defined support of, you know, uh, def outside a defined support or resistance error. And a breakout with a high volume tend to indicate that prices are more likely to move in the breakout direction. And of course, there's also the need for confirmation in the case of false breakouts. Now, as seen in the graph over here, we see, in the chart over here, we see a false breakout, you know, where we think that we'll continue to go where we, think is where we think we'll continue to go downtrend, but actually did reverse. And you know, we see equal strength of boost and best fighting within your clearly demarcated support and resistance lines. And towards the right, we actually see it actually finally breaking out uptrend, uptrend and then forming a new resistance level again. Lastly, we have our continuation patterns as well. Now, continuation patterns, essentially, they, they are indication that traders will look out for to signal that a price trend is likely to remain in play. Now, these patterns occur in the middle of a trend and signal that once a pattern has completed, the trend will most likely resume. And they are comprised of three main types, in this case, a rectangle, flag, as well as a pendant. Now for the first example, we have a rectangle, and rectangles are common continuation pattern that show a pause in the price trend with the price action moving, moving sideways. And the price action is bounded by a horizontal support and resistance line. Now in this case, we have both bullish as well as bearish rectangle. And even in both examples, you see that it is bounded, you know, in the middle portion, it is bounded by your support resistance lines, and you see an equal strength of bulls and bears fighting against one another, therefore resulting in a consolidation of equals, equal highs and low. And on the left, we see, you know, the bullish rectangle, and we see that it breaks up upwards when the bull switches to a bear, when a bear switches to a bull. And on the right, you know, we have a bearish example where it breaks down downwards with the bull switching to a bear. As for our pennant, likewise, we have both bullish as well as uh, bearish pennants as well. And you know, it often appears as a small price range of consolidation that gets even smaller over time. Now, these pennants are usually preceded by a sharp price increase or decrease, you know, depending on whether it's a bullish or a bearish pennant, and then show the market is taking a breather before breaking out again. So take for example, you know, on the left, we have a bullish pennant, which begins with a very strong initial uptrend which usually could be a consolidation at first. Usually could be a consolidation at first. <clears throat> and then consolidation in the middle where the bulls and the bears fight. Now these support and resistance lines will convert, converge, ultimately resulting in a breakout that will occur towards the end of the consolidation, of the continuation pattern. For the flag, again, we have you know, the bullish and bearish flags. Now the flags are very similar to your pandas in the sense that, uh, <clears throat> however, they do form a narrow trading, trend, trading range after a price increase or decrease.
But the difference is, however, you know, unlike your planet, they actually do move in parallel lines, either ascending or descending, descending or sideways. Uh, in contrast, however, you know, planets actually do take on a triangle shape where the trend lines converge towards a singular point. And as seen for the example, it usually begins uh, with a very strong upward trend. And in the case for your bullish flag, and the consolidation which occurs in the channel with the bears and bulls fighting each other, and then your upward and then an upward breakout where the sellers will start to buy. So to conclude our continuation pattern, you know, the first step really is to identify a parallel trend direction. So for example, whether the price was increasing or decreasing before it formed the pattern. <clears throat> the next step is to identify the continuation pattern and to find the breakout point. Now, some traders only take trades if the breakout occurs in the same direction as the prevailing trend. So for example, if the prevailing trend is up, sorry. So for example, if the prevailing trend is, yeah. So for example, if the prevailing trend is up, they will buy if the price breaks out of the pattern to the upside. Now, other traders will take a trade in the break, breakout direction, even if it goes against the prevailing trend. And these are lower odd trade, but they pay off if the trade is reversing is in the reversing direction. And a stop loss should be placed outside uh, the pattern on the opposite side of the breakout. And you know, there are also other considerations that have to be taken into account. So firstly, there's always the potential of false breakouts, as we saw previously, where the prices actually do move outside the pattern, but they go back in again. And because of that, as a matter of risk management, it's important to, in fact, necessary for you to actually uh, use your stop losses to manage your risk. Secondly, there's always the consideration of the strength of price action prior to the formation of a pattern. And you know, more often than not, a strong price move prior to uh, tend to be more reliable. And lastly, you know, continuation pattern should be relatively small, should be a relatively small part of your prior trending wave. And in this case, the bigger the pattern. Uh, relative to the preceding wave, the more volatile it will be. So last session, we also went through a few patterns that signal strong reverses. Uh, in this session, however, we'll be diving in more specifically into the candles that signal such reverses. So firstly, we have our engulfing bar. And the bearish engulfing bar is one of the most important candlestick patterns. And this candlestick patterns, uh, this candlestick pattern consists of two main bodies, of two bodies. The first body is obviously smaller than the second one. And in other words, the second, body, the second body engulfs the previous one. So take, for example, our bullish engulfing. In this case, the pattern tells us that the buyers are in control of the market. And when this pattern occurs at the end of the downtrend, what this means is that the sellers are engulfed by the buyers, which then signal a trend reversal. In the case of your bearish engulfing, this pattern tells us that the, that the sellers are in control of the market. And when this pattern occurs at the end of our uptrend, this indicates that the buyers are engulfed by your sellers which then signal a trend reversal as well. As for your hammer, the hammer candlestick is created when the open high that indicates a bullish rejection from your buyers and you know, their intention to really just push the market even higher. Now the hammer is a reversal candlestick pattern when it occurs at the bottom of the downtrend. So take the example of your bullish hammer. This candle forms when the sellers push the market lower after the open, but they got rejected by the buyers. So the market actually closes higher than the lowest price. Now the longer shadow represents the, the high buying pressure from this point. And the sellers were trying to push the market even lower, but you know, at this point, the buying power was more powerful than the selling pressure, which therefore resulted in a trend reversal. In the case of our hanging man, it is far on the top of the uptrend, and it comprises of a small candle body with, with an even extended lower shadow. Now, despite the price closing even higher than the opening, what this means is that there's a significant selling pressure due to sentiments of your price peaking, and therefore this indicates a bearish, uh, a bearish reversal of the market. As for your shooting star, now the shooting star formation is formed when the open low and close are roughly at the same price. And if you look at you know, the diagram, the candle is characterized by a very small body with a long upper shadow. And what this means is essentially, this is a bearish version of your hammer. Now the psychology behind you know, the formation of this pattern is that the buyers will try to push the market even higher, but they get rejected by the selling pressure. And of course, there's always a need for confirmation, which you know, we tend to the next candle opens below the high and closes below the low of the shooting star. As for your tweezers, 
the Teresa top occurs during the uptrend, you know, when your bulls take over, when the bulls bring the prices even higher and often closing the day off near the high. However, uh, on the second day, the traders may feel or the sentiments might reverse even like almost completely or completely. And because of that, the market opens and goes straight down, you know, often eliminating the profits or gains they have made in the previous day. Now, the reverse of bullish tweezer is true as well. And this occurs, you know, during a downtrend when the bears continue to take the price even lower, uh, usually closing the day near the lows. Nonetheless, you know, on the second day, this is the complete opposite. Sentiments may change and uh, the price open and go nowhere but upwards. And the bullish advance on the second day would usually, you know, more often than not, eliminate all, eliminate all the losses they made, almost all of the losses you made in the previous day. Lastly, we have our three black crows as well as three white soldiers. And, you know, for the three black crows, what it really means, it, it, com it comprises of three consecutive candlesticks that closes lower than the previous candle. And <clears throat> it can be utilized to, pre to predict the reversal of a current uptrend. The converse is true as well for your three white soldiers, which obviously, which likewise comprises of three consecutive candlesticks that closes above the previous candle high and is used to predict a reversal of your current downtrend. Now that I've seen the different uh, candlestick patterns, let's try to apply it. So if you look at the, you know, the left, we have our bullish hammer and it is characterized, you know, as mentioned by a long shadow at downtrend, therefore signaling a reversal. And then we go up and we go towards the right and we see our tweezers bottom, which comprises of two candlesticks with matching lows, where the previous day closing is equivalent to your current day opening price. And then we move on and we have our double tops as mentioned in the previous webinar and followed by our bullish engulfing, where the second candlestick engulfs the previous one. And lastly, ending off with our tweezers tops, which is really just the opposite of your, your tweezer bottoms, thereby indicating a reversal downtrend. Well, thank you, and I'll pass the time on now to Ernst. Yep, thanks, Hao Guang. So now I'll be moving on to indicators. And based on what we have covered so far, we can actually see that technical analysis is a reflection of what market participants are doing with their money. And it is shown in the candlestick patterns. And adding on indicators, it is likely to give us clearer signals to increase our probability of taking winning trades. And I'll be splitting it into three categories. Firstly, momentum, trend, and also volatility to give us an edge when analyzing the markets. So firstly will be the Relative Strength Index, also known as the RSI. So it is a momentum oscillator. Oscillator meaning that it goes up and then down, so on and so forth. And it measures the magnitude of recent price changes to evaluate overbought and also oversold conditions in the market. So one question that traders usually face is that if the currency pay is currently trending upwards, right, is it going to continue going higher or will it lose momentum and reverse downwards instead? So looking at the graph below, we can see the RSI ranging and oscillating between the 30 and 70 region. So basically when the RSI goes above 70, it is overbought. So if we were to explain it in terms of stocks, that particular stock is too expensive. So traders, traders will see it as a signal to sell it as they anticipate a downward reversal. And likewise, when the RSI dips below 30, it is oversold, meaning that it's very cheap and people will see it as a sign to buy into it as they are feeling optimistic that the prices will rebound upwards. So there are two main ways to trade using um, the RSI. So firstly will be the pullback method. So in a trending market, there will be impulse waves upwards, corrective waves, impulse wave, and again, the corrective waves. So the main rule of trading or, or investing in bullish upward markets is to buy low and sell high. So the same applies here. And what we are doing here is that we are looking for a pullback on the correctional wave to buy into the uptrend as seen circle in red in addition to when the RSI is below 30. So here the RSI acts as a confirmation indicator that in this case, yes, the currency pair is indeed oversold and is highly likely to bounce back up. And this gives me a good buying opportunity. And secondly, it will be the divergence method. So again, in an uptrend, the candlesticks are making higher highs and higher lows. And this generates a positive gradient. But as you can see beneath, the RSI is making lower highs, showing us a negative gradient. And the important thing here is that both gradients are different and are giving us different signals. So this implies the possibility of a market reversal. So for example, if the market is currently bullish upwards, this divergence may be a sign that the sellers are coming into control and turning it into a bear market um, for a period of time. So how then do we apply it into trading? So as you can see, there are three parts to this graph. 
So starting from the left, you can see that the RSI exceeded 70, meaning that it is overbought as we have discussed. And indeed, the price reversed downwards. So moving to the right, the trend line drawn along the candlesticks in black is making higher lows, but the RSI is making lower highs. So this divergence is likely to cause a market reversal and indeed the market did go down afterwards. And lastly, as seen on the extreme right, the RSI actually did below 30 and is an indication of an oversold condition. And we can then see the prices heading up again. So next will be the moving average convergence divergence, also known as the MACD or the MACD. So same is also a momentum oscillator which shows us market sentiment. And you can see there are two lines. Firstly will be the blue MACD line, or also known as the difference line. And it is found by subtracting the 26 exponential moving average from the 12 exponential moving average. And next will be the signal line and it's in orange. And it's also called the trigger line. And it's actually the nine exponential moving average of the MACD line, of the blue line. So a very simple way to, to identify the MACD line is that it is choppier and hence you can see it's more volatile. And then there are the green and red bars, which are called the histogram. So the height of the histogram is found by subtracting the signal line from the MACD line. So when the two lines intersect each other, the histogram will be zero, it will show zero. And the height of the bars is a reflection of how strong the current market trend is. So you can see the higher bars on the left is showing a stronger trend relative to the lower ones on the right, as you can see circle in red. So there are four main ways to interpret and use the MACD. And firstly would be when the MACD touches the signal line. So looking at the bottom left, we can see the blue line coming down and then touching the orange line without crossing it. And this is a signal of trend continuation. And indeed the markets continue trending upwards. So secondly will be um, when there is a crossover of both lines. So when the MACD line crosses above the signal line, meaning that when the blue line is above the orange line, the market is likely to reverse bullishly and vice versa for another case. And thirdly, when the lines cross from below to above the center line, which is the middle line as labeled number three on the graph, it is a bullish signal. And conversely, when the line crosses from above to below the center line, it signals bearish movement. And lastly, again, the negative divergence ingredient of the price action relative to the MACD line signals potential market reversal. So if you're in a long trade, you might want to get out or instead look for selling opportunities. So thirdly, it will be the moving averages and exponential moving averages. And this time, it is a trend following indicator, while the previous two mentioned were momentum indicators. So the moving average like we have learned in school is basically the average taken over a period of time. So simply put, a 50 moving average means that we are taking the average over 50 days. And the type of exponential moving and the exponential moving average is actually um, a type of moving average that gives more weightage to more recent price data. So looking at the graph below, we have the, we have the 50 SMA in black. And because it gives equal weight to all price levels, it is smoother. And you compare it to the two EMAs as shown in blue, right? Where both are hugging the candlesticks very closely and the price action is kind of surfing both of the blue lines. So MAs and EMAs are indications of general trend direction. So an upwards sloping MA or EMA means that the market is trending upwards as well. And for example, when a 9 and 20 EMA crosses over each other, meaning when the two blue lines have a crossover, it signals potential market reversals, which was mentioned a few times. And when a smaller EMA is above the bigger one, meaning when a 9 is above the 20, it is a bullish crossover and vice versa for another case. So next, we'll be moving on to the Bollinger Bands. And this indicator is used to measure volatility in the markets. And it's similar to RSI in a way, such that it indicates um, also overbought and oversold regions. So as you can see, there are three lines on the graph. And this is plotted on the euro dollar chart. Okay? So the middle line is a 20 moving average. And the upper and lower band are both 20 standard deviations away from the 20 SMA. So how then do we interpret this? So as you can see on the left, when there is a spike in the market, or in this example, an upward trend, you can see the bands widening. And if it's in a ranging market or the markets are in consolidation, as seen from the middle, or the bands will be relatively narrow. And in general, the prices will remain within the band, just occasionally breaking beyond it. And there are a few ways to use Bollinger Bands in our trading. 
So firstly, as a dynamic support and resistance, which we have covered in the previous webinar, meaning that when prices touches either bands, it will reverse. And next will be the mean reversion. So essentially, when the market comes down from the upper band and touches the middle band, very likely it will cross the middle band and touch the bottom band. So likewise, when the prices touch the 20 SMA from beneath, it will be the same case as well. And lastly, will be the Bollinger Band squeeze. So like in the middle, when we see the Bollinger Bands being very narrow and meaning that the prices are more or less ranging in the markets, there's a high probability that the markets will reverse. And indeed, as seen from the red arrow at the top after the consolidation and ranging stage, the prices trended bullishly. So we can use Bollinger Bands as an indication of when prices will pull back slightly or even reverse as a sign to get in or also get out of a trade. So lastly will be the Fibonacci indicator. And it sounds very complicated, but it's essentially a sequence of numbers. So as you can see on the left, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, so on and so forth. And when you take 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 3 and 5 is 5. So from this pattern, we can um, kind of infer that the next number is found by adding two numbers before it, right? And then there is this golden ratio called the phi. And what they realized was that the number sequence converges towards the golden ratio, which is 1.618 as it progresses higher and higher into the sequence. So this golden ratio also appears in biological settings and even in the measurements of our own human body. So in the context of trading, there are a few commonly used Fibonacci levels, such as the 23.6%, the 38.2%, and even the 716 and all of this was discovered by this Italian mathematician called Leonardo Bonacci. So many trading platforms offer Fibonacci retracement tools. So what we have to do is just click on it and drag it from the top to the bottom of a particular trend. And then we will see the retracement levels appearing. So in this case, you can see that um, there are five horizontal lines. And starting from the bottom of the retracement or the bottom of the graph, we can see that the price bounced off at first and came up to the 38.2 level and tested that level, which was the Fibonacci level that we mentioned just now. So the prices hit that level, retraced slightly before going up again. And this time it pushed past the 50% retracement and finally arrived at the 61.8 level, which was also mentioned just now. And that 61.8 level held as a bearish retracement. And as you can see from the, from the next few candles, the sellers continue pushing prices towards the downside. So then how do we use this to our advantage? So zooming out to the same currency pair, so you can still see is the USD JPY, it's still dollar yen on a four hour chart. And what we have covered so far is on the right side. So on the left, the yellow rectangle denotes a strong historical support zone. As you can see that it was tested three times previously as indicated from the three black arrows. And this level coincides with the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement identified. So it makes it, a very, um, it makes it a very accurate level which we can work with. So then keeping in mind this significant 61.8 level, we can then place our TP or take profit target. And this is where the Fibonacci extensions come in. So the Fibonacci extension is shown in the, from the purple graph and similar to the method of retracements, we trace from A the swing high to B the swing low, but this time we join it to C which is the 61.8 level that we identified just now. So we can see that indeed the prices came up to point C on the right, and we are now anticipating a downward reversal. So what we can do in this case is that we can set up a sell order entry at C, and we set our stop loss a little bit above the yellow support zone, and then we can take profit at the 38.2 level. right? And this gives us a risk to reward ratio of four, meaning that I'm risking one R to make four R. And for those that are more ambitious, you can even TP at the 61.8 level when the R to R ratio is almost seven. So after learning about price action in, in addition to indicators, you have to make sure that the strategy that we identified is actually usable and profitable. And that's where backtesting comes in. So backtesting consists of two parts. Firstly will be the rules and strategies. So essentially you have to test your trading so essentially you have to test your trading plans while obeying the rules that you set for yourself. So for example, I will only risk 1R to make 1.5R or I'll only risk 1R to make 2R. So this means that you have to be consistent when practicing trading and also to be strict with yourself. 
So then applying these mechanics that we have learned and the trading tools that we have selected into historical data, we have to monitor the results. So asking ourselves like, are there more wins than losses or are we actually breaking even? So as you can see, this graph below is plotted from TradingView, which is a trading platform where they have a buy replay feature, which is really, really convenient, especially for backtesting. So let's say for example, I want, to, I want to backtest the 2019 data. So I choose that bar replay feature and I click on the end of December. And this will result in a black vertical line appearing. And what it does is that it erases all of the data on the right, right? It erases all of the data of 2019, which is a year that we want to test our strategies on. So it removes any kind of bias as we, we will not be tailoring our, our technical analysis according to what we see. But according to what we see or according to future price action, but instead it's the opposite. And as you can see, there is an identified area of support as shown by the yellow triangle once again, yellow rectangle once again. And the prices actually came down to test that area a few times, but sellers are unable to continue pushing prices down and buyers take over. And this sends the price upwards. So look looking at the last bearish candlestick, which is the one in red, it's right beside the black vertical line. So this is where we ask ourselves, um, in January 2019, will sellers finally be able to push past that support level and drive the prices downwards? Or will buyers still be in control of the market instead? So that's where we can use the analysis that we have learned previously. Like for example, candlestick patterns, chart patterns, the RSI, the MACD, the Fibonacci levels to, to increase our accuracy in deciding these trades. So afterwards, we can actually play the price action of 2019 again and see whether our analysis was right or was it off. And then we can make changes and adjustments accordingly. So this is an example of um, back testing conditions. So for example, such as using a risk to reward ratio of one to one, right? So we start off small and repeat it for 50 times. And then we journal these trades that we took into a spreadsheet with details like um, which currency pair we're trading, our wins, our losses, our ROI, et cetera. So as you can see on the left, next, um, this is a clean chart, right? But in a real life situation, it is a lot more complex as shown on the right. So if you were to trade purely based on crossovers as shown by the small blue crosses on the right side, there will be a lot of, a lot of false signals. And what we can do when back testing is that after we identify areas of losses of the, on the right, we can then add an additional 30 days moving average on the left to smooth out price action for clearer signals. And we can also set conditions where instead of a one-to-one, -one, we can try a one-to-three risk to reward ratio, right? And then we can test it on various currency pairs and different market conditions to find out if it is a viable strategy. And on the left side of this chart, before the crossover, you can see that there is a long bullish candlestick of around 45 pips, which is, which is a lot compared to the average seven pips. And this is due to market volatility, right? Meaning that there is a high chance that that particular candlestick will retrace. And this makes it difficult for us to set a stop loss and may lead to inaccurate crossovers. And this will cause it to become a losing trade overall. So as you can see, essentially back testing consists of um, a lot of trial and error. So seeing which method works for you, which strategy to use in different market conditions, and then finding a combination of tools that suit you best. Yep. So as a wrap up, we can view technical analysis as a journey. And we have to look at the basics like candlestick patterns, trend lines, support and resistance. And then in combination with a few other indicators, we can increase our probability of winning and at the same time, minimizing our losses. So we cannot win all the time, but as we take more and more trades and because we stick to strict risk management rules, where we always risk one R to make more than one R, our profits will show in the long run with the correct strategy. Yep, and this wraps up the entire presentation. Back to you, Alastia. All right, thank you so much, Hao Gang and Enzi for the sharing. We will now be moving on to the question and answer segment for today's webinar. So we appreciate all the questions that were submitted so far. And if you still have questions, feel free to access the question and answer form via the link or by scanning the QR code as shown in the slide above. We'll try our best, but should we face time constraints, we may not be able to address all the questions. So let's start with our first question. Our first question is from Alex and he asked, 
out of all the indicators, what is the best indicator in your opinion? Do I have to use them all? Or will I just need to use a main one that works? Well, there is no standalone indicator or best indicator. So we always see people asking traders or commenting on trading YouTube videos that exact question. And then the answer will always be, it depends really on your trading style and your personality. So, so for example, as mentioned, the MACD can be used as an exit strategy or a confirmation indicator, right? while the Fibonacci retracement and extensions is best used in trending markets, meaning where in an uptrend, we look for pullbacks or bounces to get, to get into that long trade and ride the upward trend. Right? While the Bollinger Bands can be used to look for take profit levels, such as when the price hits either the lower or the upper band. So I would suggest choosing maybe one indicator from each category. So we have mentioned trend, momentum, and volatility. But there are a few more categories such as volume and even more indicators such as the ATR, the force index, the parabolic SAR, or even stochastics. So having about three broad indicators and then combining it with pure price action analysis, it will give us a setup. All right, and then of course you have to kind of test that stretch up, test that setup that you have or that strategy that you have through back testing, right? And this allows us to see whether it gives us consistent profits in, at least in the long run, right? Or if not breaking even. So if you're making more losses, then you might choose to you might choose other combinations of indicators or brush up on candlestick analysis and such. Yeah. All right, thank you for the answer. Um, our second question is from Alvin. So this question is directed at uh, Hao Kuang. So earlier on, when you mentioned about economic indicators, you did not talk about uh, non-farm payroll, which is equally important. So how does the non-farm payroll actually affect the currency market? Mm, well, I mean, okay, so to begin, for those who don't really know, uh, the non-farm payroll is also likewise, it's also another economic indicator that measures you know, the sum of Pay, payroll jobs are available within the sphere of non-payrolls, of non-farm payrolls. So obviously this excludes you, know, you if you're a farm worker. But to my knowledge, I think it also excludes, excludes jobs like you know, government workers, as well as non-profit employees, if I'm not wrong. And now, so what, what does it actually mean? So if, you know, if there's, obviously if there's an increase in your employment, then there'll definitely be a good signal to your currency market. But if you dive deeper, it actually signals a lot more than that. And First and foremost, you know, if it dives in very specifically and shows the sectors which the increase and the decrease in the jobs actually came from, which really is just a heads up, you know, for you if you want to, for you on which sector you should, you should or you want to focus on. And secondly, it also shows, you know, the unemployment rate as the percentage of your overall uh, workforce, which really just, which, which is a good indicator for the health of the economy. And in that regard, I think it's a very good thing. It's, it's good for you to identify trends that you know pertain to these two things, economic growth as well as inflationary pressure. Now, if the non <clears throat> if the non-farm payrolls are expanding, then obviously that expansion would mean that the economy is growing and would signal a good thing for the currency market. If, however, the increase in your non-farm payroll occurs at too fast of a rate, and in this case where people start to actually demand for higher wages, this will actually lead to or potentially lead to an increase in inflationary pressure and may be viewed as negative for the economy as well as for your currency market. Now, the data on wage growth and the rate of unemployed, which are usually included in the monthly job reports as well. I think, you know, as a whole, you know, these two things can be used to shape your total inflationary pressure, your inflationary expectations, as well as estimates for your economic growth. All right. Thank you, Hao Kong, for your answer. Um, our next question is from Wei Cheng. And he asked uh, that he said that he's currently a student. So what kind of trading would best suit him? Well, for this question, the answer will be depends again, like just now, because it really depends on your personality and your uh, kind of like your personal schedule. So personality wise, right? So maybe you're someone who is conservative and hence you are risk averse. So in this case, scalping may not be the best choice for you, right? Because it's very fast paced. You know, you're in and out of the trade in a matter of minutes or even seconds. And it gets very frustrating if the, if the markets don't go the way that you want it to. And hence, you may suit day or swing trading more. So in the case of us students, I personally feel that day or swing trading is the most suitable because it allows us flexibility. 
So for example, if, if you're a morning person, right, you can consider trading the Asian session. Or you, if you have classes or work in the day and you're only free at night, then you can consider trading the US London overlap, which is the best anyways, because um, overlap session in general provides traders with the greatest liquidity. And hence, in my opinion, it is the best time to trade as it is when our technical analysis of the markets will usually work out best during these peak hours, yeah, due to the high volume during the overlap sessions. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, our next question is from Dominic, and he asked that earlier in the presentation, it was mentioned about how interest rates can affect the currency market. However, we have countries that, you know, such as Japan, who have like negative interest rates. So how, how does that work? Mm, no, I mean, okay, so to begin, you know, negative interest rates, they are really unorthodox. They are unorthodox monetary policies that are used by the central banks to actually combat you know, difficult, difficult economic situations like recession and so on. And, you know, the thing is when your CBs actually do set a negative interest rate, your depositors, such as your commercial banks and so on, must actually pay these CBs their interest to actually store their money in there or their reserves in there. And what this essentially means is that this will actually encourage your depo depositors to actually invest rather than save and, you know, therefore actually simulates economic growth. Now, the most conventional, conventional monetary policy would actually focus on just you know lowering interest rate, which remains, which still remains positive. And you know, most economists has, have actually argued that the lower bound for it would be zero. Now, why is that? Because at the point, you know, there would actually actually exist this thing known as arbitrage opportunity, whereby your bonds and money would essentially be perfect substitutes. And that is what we all know as the liquidity trap. But for negative interest rate, however, some people argue that the that the lower bound is actually below zero. How far, zero it is, how far below zero it is, I don't know, but there are arguments that the lower bound is still below zero instead of just zero, where this, as mentioned earlier on, early on, will actually encourage your banks to give out loans instead of parking it in your central banks. And by setting a negative interest rates, uh, your commercial banks also by definition and by extension, will have to lower your interest rates uh, in their loans such that people actually borrow it and for these loans to be stored somewhere else. And as a result, you know, your banks can store their money, uh, you know, with your retail investors or so on, without actually having to actually pay the CBs the deposit rate. And, you know, while, while they may not actually receive uh, much interest on these loans at all, uh, they actually wouldn't be losing money outright, or uh, that much money outright by storing excess reserves in the central bank. Now, that being said, what is the effect of, you know, a negative interest rate on your currency? You know, if the central banks actually do set a negative interest rates on deposits, uh, what it really means uh, is that it will actually weaken your currency and it, the, the currency that issues compared to, you know, relatively compared to other currencies that is paired within an forex market. And, you know, this is because negative interest rates, you know, as mentioned previously, they would lower the returns that investors will actually receive by buying and depositing on the, currency, on the country's currency. And because of that, they would actually shift the investment to a country where the interest rate actually pays higher. And so what it means is that it could really cause a great reduction in the demand of you know, domestic currency in a country which actually set a negative interest rate, which therefore weakens its value on the forex market. However, you know, if you're a trader, that doesn't actually mean it's a bad thing. You know, if you know that it's actually potentially depreciating, what you can do is you can, you can actually hold a short position on this currency on the forex market. And you know, this means also that traders who are actually long or could have reserves of their currency in question could actually stand to incur as it, fall, as it falls in value. But, you know, this is not always, the effect of it is not really clear. Whatever I just said is really just in theory. Um, and one such example is, you know, the euros uh, and Swiss, uh, the yen, sorry, and one such example would be your yen as well as your Swiss franc, which actually appreciated in spite of your negative interest rate. And one example is because, you know, these currencies, your US, uh, Swiss franc, as well as your yens, these are your safe haven currencies, which people will actually flock into, especially in times of uncertainty. And, you know, one such example was in, if I'm not wrong, 2015, when, you know, it was coupled with you know, Chinese economic downturn, uh, Brexit, and so on, which really is just a very great, a great time of uncertainty. And in spite of that, you see that Japanese investors, you know, they started to avoid overseas investments, and instead they flocked back and they purchased their own yen instead. And moreover, you know, when you talk about uh, Switzerland, Japan, uh, this, these are very rich countries in general with a very, very large overseas holdings. So especially in times of trouble, 
they can always respond by liquidating your overseas holding and converting this, this proceeds back you know, into yen or Swiss franc and thereby repatriating the, account, the money. All right, thank you, Hao Huang. Um, due to time constraints, we are only available for one last question. And this question is from Dick Yo. He asked, uh, it's a question also for Hao Kang's slide. He asked, how do you find the point of confluence and why is it important? Um, I think when you're talking about confluence, it really is just you know, trying to find two or more signs that you have found, which is you know, just a safe opportunity for you to buy or sell. And there are various ways you can do it. Uh, one such example could be you know, using indicators, for example. And so for example, in the slide just now, we, drew it, we, we marked out the support and resistance lines using the indicator. And a popular way of combining this support and resistance uh, lines would be using Bollinger Bands uh, as covered by NC. So when a support or resistance level actually meet the lower band, it is, well, it's a signal for you to actually buy. And if the support and resistance level meet the higher band, then it could be a signal for you to sell as well. All right. Um, thank you so much, Hao Guang and NC, for the insightful session. I hope that everyone has developed a better understanding on the strategies and what to look out for while conducting technical analysis. Do note that the content of our sharing today could be confined to several limitations. So before you actually embark on technical analysis, please do some self-research on your own. Uh, we thank you for making the time to attend this webinar and hope that it has been an informative session for you. We would appreciate it if you could leave some feedback for us so that we can better know the type of content that you guys are looking for. So once you fill up the feedback form, you will be granted access to today's slides via email. And do, do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you found this content useful. So moving forward, we'll be hosting three webinars in the month of July, of which two are partnered with Skills Future Singapore, with speakers from the Employment and Employability Institute. They would be exploring on how one can develop skill sets amid such trying times. So do join us if you're free on those dates. More details of the upcoming events could be found on our LinkedIn page. Once again, thank you for your time. Uh, do leave us some feedback for the webinar that we had. And that will be all from us today. Have a nice week ahead.